Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Prospect Corner here at the Hockey Writers. I'm your host, Matthew Zator. As always, joined in my prospect expert, Peter Barracchini. And also, we've got a special guest. He has been on the show before, but uh, Lucas uh, Bernasevich. Um, Lucas, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks, guys, for having me. September's here. We're ready, ready to get started. Ready to roll. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're diving into the top 100 prospects uh, list update. I have a preseason update mid and a midseason, and this is the preseason one. And this has all the drafted prospects now included. So uh, it's a pretty new list. There's quite a few uh, familiar names and then some new ones. And we're going to do what our, we usually do uh, and go through the whole list, not every single player. But we're going to go by groups of 10 and just highlight some guys we want to talk about. So... Let's just jump right in into the 100 to 91 range here. And I'll start with you, Lucas. Uh, who do you want to highlight from this first um, 10 of the top 100 here? Well, uh, I think we're going to start off, uh, start up up the middle. I'm going to go with Owen Beck, a Montreal Canadiens prospect, uh, most likely playing in Laval this year. Uh, I think that uh, when, uh, when Owen Beck was picked, uh, first pick in the second round back in 2022, I was a little shocked that he was... Uh, I know that he and uh, Luca Del Bell Blues, I, uh, I, I live really close to Mississauga. I got to watch them a bunch. I was a little surprised that he went ahead of, uh, of Del Bell, but watching him develop over these last two years with, with a combination of him being in Mississauga and in Peterborough and in Saginaw, I got to watch him at the Memorial Cup. He is a dynamic force out there. He's a leader. He's, uh, he's a great offensive player. But as a center, you see the little details that he has, the little, uh, the little things that, uh, that um that gives him the advantage and uh, uh for those who watched the memorial cup game he had two ma ma magnificent goals for for saginaw just absolute bullets that he ripped uh and uh i i, I really i've liked this player for a long time and i'm uh, as someone who grew up cheering for the toronto maple leafs i hope he doesn't do too well but uh <laughs> i uh i i've always i've always really really liked this player and i think Montreal's really really gonna like this guy for sure, and and he's has one NHL game under his belt. He was brought up uh, for an emergency call up there was a couple seasons ago, and uh, but yeah, he's he's been a leader on his team on Team Canada and anything that he's been in, and he's going to end up being a really good. I don't know about a top line center, but definitely a good second line, third line guy that can be relied on defensively, offensively. I, I really like him too. All right, over to you, Peter. Uh, who do you want to highlight from this 10? Yeah, um, I'm going to highlight probably the one of many Carolina Hurricanes prospects that are probably going to be on here. We're going to talk about <laughs> a lot, and that's Felix Ungersorum. Um, you know, when he was drafted, obviously, maybe the size factor played into it because, I don't know, there was potential that maybe he could have moved up, could have been a first rounder. But the Hurricanes took him late in the second. Um he was teetering on that second, third round, which kind of seemed fitting. But you know what? When you saw the, like the raw skill that he had, it probably could have been a first rounder. And with the playmaking, the speed, and the pace that he plays with, um, his ability, his ability to find his teammates is just very, very consistent. And you're seeing the progression. You know, in his draft year, he had 46 points in 42 games. He had four points in one game at the J20 National before he got called up with 15 and 35 with Alexans. And then from the world, uh, world juniors um, and everything else after that, it seemed like he kept getting more confident and more, you know, um, steady at the pro level. And now that he's going to be at the pro level, probably getting more regular minutes this time around, it's going to be great for his development because this is going to be another highly skilled, dynamic playmaker that the Carolina Hurricanes have in their system. And you know how much they love that skill. Uh, to see him in 93 here is very, very promising for him and for the Canes, but I'm I, I I'm just really like excited to see what he can do this season because he's really taking everyone by storm right now. 
Yeah, the second round pick, late in the second round, too. I, the Hurricanes seem to be able to find these guys uh, later in the draft, and they always make the playoffs. They're always an elite team, and they seem to still have a good prospect pool. I, they're just like the Dallas Stars in that way. They're, they're both teams are very good, even though they're – you know, they're not rebuilding or bad team. They still able to get some really solid picks at later in the draft, which is just testament to the scouting uh, that they can do. So, yeah, I, I really like him, too. I think he's going to end up being a really good uh, player for the Hurricanes in the future. He could even get, you know, some games this year, potentially. Um, we'll mm -hmm. see. That's going to be interesting to watch. All right, let's move to 90 to 81. And uh, I'll stay with you, Peter. Who do you want to highlight from this group? Uh, I was thinking with one of my favorites during the draft year, and that's Jet Lachenko um, in 2024. Like, he was very off the radar kind of thing. But in one game that I saw, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to keep tabs on this one player and come back to him every single time. And every single time I watched him, I came away even more impressed. And he just dramatically increases draft stock uh throughout the whole entire draft year 74 points in 68 games with the Guelph Storm he really didn't have the best consistency overall as a team but he was the lone bright spot and the energy that he plays with the speed the playmaking again his he may seem a bit undersized 5'11 187 but he shows no fear he's he's a relentless battler and he's always in pursuit of the puck and you know, considering how the Flames are already starting to get or reap some of those benefits with Matt, Matt Bay Mitchkov coming up, um, having Jet Lachenko in their system is just very, very impressive because he's a transitional player that can probably complement that to a dynamic winger of Matt Bay Mitchkov. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens because he's got a steady uh, and responsible 200 foot game. Um, but I, I, I was happy for him to get selected higher than usual because maybe for me, it was still like a little late, later part of the draft, but to see him go higher and to see him, uh, go to the Philadelphia Flyers, that's a great pick for them. So I'm, he's my pick for this range. He probably will fit. I don't know how, if he's going to still, he's going to be there when John Tortorella is still there, but he seems like mm -hmm. a player that he would like. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if had input in on this because it just seems like a guy that would really fit with Tortorella's coaching. I, I think he'd become a favorite of his too. So, yeah, I, I I think he could be a really good, solid guy for the Flyers too. All right, Lucas, uh, what about you? Who do you want to highlight here? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight my Polish brethren and the person whose last name is similar to mine. I'm going to, I'm going Hunter Brustevich with the <laughs> Calgary Flames. Um, uh, Hunter, uh, although his, his defensive game needs work, you cannot, you cannot look away from the offensive output that this guy has put in, uh, first year in the OHL as a defenseman, uh, playing with a good Kitchener Rangers team. He almost goes at a point per game with 57 points in 68 games. And then in this last year, just takes off 92 points as a defenseman on uh, on a Kitchener Ranger team that again was probably better than the year in the year before and with I, I thought that and I, I've written about this I thought Vancouver was I, I thought it was a very very um I'm trying to find the right word I didn't think it was the greatest decision for them to, to give up on him in the Elias Lindholm trade mm -hmm. uh I I've, I've been public about this I was not a fan of them giving up on him so so soon because I think that now in the Calgary system, Calgary has a can have a staple on the right side with both him and uh, and Zane Parekh on the right side for for many years to come. He's he's finally signed his his entry level a few months ago. He was going to be playing the uh, the year with the Wranglers. I've always loved this player. I've always had an eye on him, and I love the offensive instincts uh, for this player as a defenseman. And I just think you can't you can't ignore that. And I'm really excited to see what he's able to do this year. Well, Peter, you know, I, uh, he was a staple on my prospects of the week. I don't know how many times I had him in there last season. I lost count. Yeah. And I kept saying, it's like, and then when he was traded, yeah, I didn't like it either. I'm like, what are you doing? And he, he's, yeah, I, I don't know. He's not, he's going to be a really good player. And, and now the Canucks don't have anyone, um, to, to stay for that trade because Lindholm's now in Boston. So it's like all these guys have been gone to Calgary and now we just have to watch them and hopefully they don't become superstars uh, in Calgary. So, but Brustavich is going to be a heck of a player. And I, yeah, I, I agree. I did not like that trade that he was included in that, but 
I'm going to say sell high on a guy, on the guy and who knows, we'll, we'll see what he can do later on. But I, I like that he's on this list, even though he's now a flames prospect. All right. Now on to 80 to 71 and uh, Lucas, I'll stay with you. Who do you want to highlight from here? Uh, there, uh, I have a list of three for all of these and uh, trying to figure it out right now, but I think I'm going to go Andrew Crystal, uh, Kelowna Rockets. Always re really, really like this guy. I think that um, he really took a step up playing, uh, playing, you know, I know he was injured for a bit, but having Tij again on the Rockets definitely helped him this year. Um, he's just, a, he's <laughs> Sam Costantino and uh, described him as like, he's just, he's just a guy you love to be around. And that's, that's, that's how he plays the game. He's just, he, he's a firecracker of a player. He's fast. He's got a great, he's got a great shot. Obviously the skating needs a little bit of work. That was the reason that he fell in the draft. A lot of people were, were surprised that he went in the second round uh, to Washington, but uh, he's only, he's only going to develop more. He's a great offensive player. And I, I love what he brings just purely from that uh, put the puck in the net situ uh, standpoint. He's obviously got other things he's got to figure out in his game, but if you got a player that could score, you got a player that could set up. That's, that's a guy that I, I love. I, I love watching. And uh, I, I'm, I, I think Washington really, really got to steal with him. Oh, hundred percent. He dropped and we were saying he was going to drop. I mean, his size, that was just going to be inevitable. He was going to drop into the second round most likely, but I still think that a bunch of teams just passed on him and he shouldn't have been, shouldn't have dropped so far. And now the capitals have got the benefit of it. So we'll see what he can do later on. All right, Peter, uh, who do you want to look at here? Um, I was going to go Gavin Brindley, but I am not going to go Gavin Brindley because I've talked about Gavin Brindley so much. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go with Theo Lynchstein of uh, the St. Louis Blues. Um, I probably was a little bit higher for most of the year. Like I always had him as a late first rounder in 2023, but then kind of dr uh, dropped after that. to so like maybe the early parts, like, you know, before the 40 range. Um and it's a lot of because of that, you know, he may just seem like the safe bet, but there isn't anything wrong with players like that because he's just so steady and consistent and there's nothing wrong with that. I like players that, you know, may not have that exciting wow factor to them, but can keep things simple and make the smart plays every single time. And Linsign Lin has done that every single time I've seen him play and he excels at he's excelled at every single level. Again, the production may not be there, but the smarts and awareness is. And for that, I really like him in this range where he's a top 100 prospect. But again, upside may not be there, but I do like what he brings to the table. For sure. And the Blues, they are, they're rebuilding, I guess, now. And you're looking at they're going to have to rebuild their defense because they have so many older guys under big contracts and they're going to try to get out of that. And Linston could be a guy that could fill one of those roles. And uh, yeah, it could be a good just a good depth defenseman. And uh, you say not, not anyone that's going to jump off the page, but you need those guys too. All right, Lucas. So uh, who do you have from this range? Well, uh, I'm going to go European here too. And uh, Philip Beast out of the San Jose Sharks. Um, first of uh, sorry. First round pick 2022. Really, really like this player as uh, you know, as a center. Um, he, he brings a lot to the game, six foot four, and uh, he's been he's finally come over to North American ice, and I think that's that's always the big thing. Is I I love it's a it's there's a weird time at the end of the season, start of the playoffs, where all of the European players come over to uh, come over to North America and 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 experience the AHL for the first time. And his first time experiencing the AHL, he in eight games he already scored seven points. He he looks like he's very much ready to take a huge jump in San Jose's prospect pool that is very 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 stacked. He's probably one of the older ones, though, but it's but it's looking very, very good. And I think that they're they're a team to watch this year in the AHL. But even just playing in Lynch Chopin, like in a men's league, he was he did not look out of place, did not get bullied around by by older players. Uh, looked like he belonged, played incredibly well at the World Juniors. Always really liked this player, and uh, and I, I, I'm I'm very excited to see how he progresses this year. Yeah, the Sharks say, uh, I mean, they are obviously a rebuilding team. They're, they're now one of the worst, well, they were the worst team last season. And now you're looking at, you know, Celebrini as your, of course, your main center. And Bistec could be your your second, third line guy. And who knows? Uh, he has 2022 now. It seems so far in the past. <laughs> we're into 2025 coming up. But 
yeah, he, he's a, a big centerman that could definitely be a difference maker in San Jose too. All right, Peter, uh, who do you have from 70 to 61? Um, I mean, I'm going to go with the Seattle Kraken and, and again, another team with an embarrassment of riches and David Goyette. It seems like selecting him late in the second round in 2022 is coming up like an absolute steal because ever since then, you know, he's put he put up 92 points in the season after he was drafted and he put up 117 last year alone with the Sudbury Wolves. So insane production. And it seems like he got better every single year. And he's just very, very calm with the puck. I mean, he he's just so confident overall. He can make plays, feather passes. He can do it all. And even the goal scoring is kind of start, sort of seen a bit of an uptick as well. And it's weird to say for like a, a, a guy that has reached 30 goals each year in the junior level. But it seems like the playmaking is his MO. But the shot factor is still evident in his game as well. So... When he has those opportunities, he's not afraid to shoot it. But he's very creative, very elusive, and he's and he, and again, he's always seeming he always seems to feather those passes very, very well, and connect with his teammates. So, um, we always again we talk about how great teams have a, with a prospect system, and David Goya just makes the Seattle Kraken that much deeper. And can't wait to see what he does in the AHL next year, or even if he battles for an NHL spot. Probably not likely, but seeing him at the pro level is going to be exciting. Yeah, there's another team, the Kraken. They they're a very young team, but they sure have a good prospect pool already, and a lot of quality guys, a lot of even good depth guys that are are yeah. I don't know how they've built up such a good prospect pool in such a short time, but there's again a good scouting staff, and uh, and we'll see how they all pan out. Um, before we move on, I wanted I want to mention Liam Ogren from the Minnesota Wild because. I've always liked this player and I think they got just a steal when they drafted him and he was going to end up, he may get some time in the NHL. Who knows? Um, you know, he's going to be in the AHL for sure. Uh, but I think he could end up maybe even surprising and making the the wild roster uh, coming out of training camp. And I I've always liked him because of his, his work ethic, a guy that can just do a lot of things. Well, I mean, he's not, doesn't have the, one thing that you can point out and saying he's got elite at, but uh, he does have a lot of good things that he, that he does on the ice that you're going to need in the NHL. And I don't know where his ceiling is. I mean, he could end up being a first, second line guy, but just because of all the things that he can do well, I think he could end up being just a guy you can throw wherever in the lineup and, and he'll be a valuable guy to be on the team. So uh, Ogren should be a guy you should be watching. Everyone should be watching this season because I, I think he could end up being on the wild at some point. All right, moving into 60 to 51. And uh, Lucas, I'll start with you with this one. Uh, who where do you want? Who do you want to highlight? Uh, going back to Europe, and I, uh, I I love this player. I love what he brings. They're going Stan Solberg from the from the in the Anaheim Ducks organization. Just uh, I think it was Cam Robinson from Elite Prospects, most violent player in this last year in this last <laughs> yeah. draft. You know, he's there's there's not much you could say, especially from the offensive perspective, but just the fact that he's able at such a young age to just run over players. You know, very much an old school like like uh, like player going back to the you know eighties nineties hockey um, and playing in the World Championships for Norway. You know, a team that you know isn't is it face it isn't up there with the higher echelon teams playing against teams like Canada and the U S he was standing up to players. He was standing up to NHL guys. Um, and, and he's only, and he's, he's only 18 years old. Mm-hmm. So looking, looking at how much he's going to develop by the time he gets to the NHL run away. Anyone who's in the Pacific division, <laughs> he, cause he is going to be a menace out there and it's only a matter of time before uh, before he gets there, it'll take him a couple of years. But once he gets here, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with when he comes to the NHL. Well, right now they got Radko Gouda, so he could just basically replace him. But he goes. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if Gouda will still be there. I kind of, I know it was a, it was a longer term contract, but um, yeah, I, he he definitely again a guy that I think dropped a bit further than I thought he would um, down in the draft. We were saying he was going to be a bit higher, but yeah, he's closing up being in the top 50 here, close to. So that that's pretty great to, to see. All right, Peter, who do you want to 
highlight from this uh, group of prospects? Uh, won't be long before he gets taken off this list, I think. And that's going to be Maverick Bork of the Dallas Stars, yeah. the Stars of the AHL, um, because every single year that he's played in, whether it's QMJHL or AHL, he is adapted very well. He The transition was basically flawless every single time, and he's dominated every single year. I mean, in the AHL last season, yeah, he was old, well over a point per game, 77 and 71, and he led the league in scoring. Um as you know, a very young player, I believe he was only 20 years old at the time, 22. So that alone just proves that he's ready for the next level. I can't see him staying in the AHL for long, even if he it does start the year there because of that high, high skill set, the IQ and the awareness that he can play a strong 200 foot game. Uh, both him and Stankoven are the team's top prospects and Stankoven's already up there right now in the NHL. I, I, I can't see it or can't see Bork being in the AHL long if he does start there this season to get a call up and be a factor for a very deep Dallas Stars team that could just push their way through and make another deep playoff run because he's going to be very key because of that pace and the smarts that he possesses every single time he's on the ice. Yeah, Bork won't be on this list. I think once we get to the pre uh, the midseason one, he'll be off of it because he's going to start in Dallas and uh, and – could be, and I'm not going to say he's in the, going to be the Calder race, but I mean, oh, you never know. He, he could, uh, he led the, he led this, the AHL in scoring. So I don't know. He could end up being a pretty good guy <laughs> to maybe an under the radar pick for Calder. All right. We're moving into the top 50 now. And uh, this is where you're going to have to be hard to pick some of these guys to talk about, but uh, Peter, who do you want to, Talk about the top, the 50 to 41 range. Uh, I hate to be a homer here, but I'm going to take Easton Cowan because of the story that he has had all season long. And it, it really is impressive. I mean, we go from seeing him as, you know, a potential third round pick getting selected in the first round and then approaching a hundred point season with a 42 game point streak that stretched, you know, regular season playoffs being named regular season and OHL MVP. That alone is impressive. I, I, I this is, I would be saying the same thing if Cowan wasn't part of the Maple Leaf system. Um, and the fact now that he's very confident when he came out of the development camp, he, he's pushing for a roster spot. And now the talk is probably going to be, is he going to earn that nine game tryout? What's going to happen after that? Because the Maple Leafs are thin on the right side or on the left side, and he can play both center and wing. But if they need a left wing, someone that can have that speed, pace, and offense, Cowan's definitely going to be one of those guys to be relied on. We'll see what happens this season, but it, it's hard not to highlight him because of the journey that he's had in the season that he had last season. He's going to be poised for a bigger one this time around. Yeah, I mean, he has a good chance of, I mean, he has a pretty good chance of making the Maple Leafs roster at least special, at least the nine games. Like you said, I think he could, he could be a surprise um, addition. I don't know how many spots the Maple Leafs have for a guy like for him to mm -hmm. take for a full season, but uh, I think he's got, he's got definitely a good chance of taking that nine games for sure. All right, Lucas, uh, who do you want to look at? Well, uh, so, something that I covet, I think more than most, is goal scoring. Someone that could fill the fill the net, and uh, that's going to be with my player. I'm going Carson Rakoff with the Brampton Steelheads now in the Seattle Kraken system. Another Kraken Kraken <laughs> uh, uh, prospect. They, they they've just filled up with nothing but CHL players. There's nothing yeah. else that they have. <laughs> but uh, Car Carson Rakoff was obviously on people's lists in 2023. But I don't think anyone expected that he would have the offensive explosion mm. that he had. Mm in this past season he had 52 goals and 95 points and the only person that was ahead of him in goal scoring was anthony romani who was his teammate back in minor <laughs> hockey so so he's just a, he's a dynamic player and i love i love dynamic players that can be relied upon i, I was watching uh uh, Kitchener Ranger film uh, recently for something, and he's just he's always on the even though he's a left-handed shot, he's on the power the 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 OB spot on the one time on the one timer, even though he's he would be on the right side, and he's just filling the net every single time. It's going in, it's going in, it's going in. It might take a little bit of time for him to adapt with a new team, you know, playing with Porter Martone, playing with Luke Misa and other players on the Steelheads. It may take a little bit of time for him to to adapt, but I don't see him losing a step, even though he's playing with a new team. Always love this player. I love what he can do with, do just in the offense 
offensive zone and his offensive instincts alone, I think is something that everyone should watch. If, if you're, if you're in the GTA, GTA uh, get, you know, this, this guy's worth the price of, admit, of, of admission and Seattle has another great prospect. Yeah. It, it, he's the one guy I think we highlighted quite a bit on prospect of the week too. I know Peter, you highlighted him one time, mm -hmm. at least once. Uh, but I, yeah, he, he's been a, Heck of a play for, and again, the Kraken get another one. Jaeger Furkus was in just in the last group. He was another guy that dominated I the league last year too. I mean, they, Kraken just, <laughs> it, they, they just have a good prospect pool. That's just the bottom line. All right, let's move to the next group, and that's uh, 40 to 31. And uh, again, the prospects keep getting better. And I'll start with you, Lucas. Who do you want to highlight from the 40 to 31? Well, Peter was a homer on the last time, and I'm going to be a homer again because I'm going with my Oakville boy, Callum Ritchie of the Oshawa Generals and the Colorado Avalanche system. I've known Callum since since he first got drafted into Oshawa. Uh, he was on he was on one of the best AAA teams uh, in in the town when uh, growing up with uh, playing with Nick Lardis and Luke Misa. Um, he took a he took a massive step coming back from a shoulder injury this year. Uh, he missed 20 games at the start. Uh, and then just like like Raykov, he 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 took off, ex exploded. He doesn't have the goal scoring like Raykov does, but he scored scored eighty points in fifty games. Was Oshawa's leader as they went to the as they went to the the, the finals in the OHL. Obviously, they they didn't stand much of a chance against London without Seneca, but uh, but he he was one of their leaders, probably their their main leader without Beckett. And uh, I assume he'll he'll be I assume he'll be the captain this year. He'll, he'll definitely be in the running, and uh, Colorado has a has a really really uh, has a really great player, and he's going to be that second line center that they have desperately needed. Yeah. The Colorado <laughs> Avalanche have desperately needed since Kadri left uh, in the off season of 2022. This is a player that is relied upon in every situation in Oshawa. He's relied upon uh, anytime you you call him, he's there. And uh, Callum Ritchie, uh, that's my pick for this one, for this uh, group. Yeah, and I know he was uh, on the Avalanche preview show, who would, which is coming out. Well, it'll be out when you guys are watching this. If you want to look at that, I, you know, Stefano said he could potentially uh, get the nine game tryout at the beginning of the season because he thinks he could actually. Um, could, I don't think he's going to make the team or play the whole season, but I we'll see. Uh, he's a guy definitely to watch uh, in training camp and the preseason as well. All right, Peter, uh, who do you have from this group? Uh, it's going to be Montreal's 21st overall pick in 2024, Michael Hage. Um, I just the story overall too with him of you know being injured for most of his draft last season and his draft year, the passing of his father in the summer, and to still persevere and play with a heavy heart and dealing with a lot of adversity and to come out flying. I know he didn't have the best start, but he had the most terrific finish of any prospect that I've seen, especially at the USHL level. And it ultimately put him on the map as a potential top 20 prospect. He was just on the verge of that. I know that there were a lot of rankings that had him a lot higher as well because of that jump. And the speed, the skill, the hands, the creativity that he possesses, it basically bodes with what Montreal wants to do. They want to be highly skilled. They want to be difficult to play against with that skill and Hage Hage can do that consistently every single night when he's on the ice. Um, you know, uh, obviously there's probably going to be a little bit of concerns because he's got to develop, probably get a little bit stronger overall as well, but you can't deny this fact that he is very, very skilled and he's got decent size as well. Um, so I, I, I think that he's definitely worthwhile or worth keeping an eye on in this range or not in this range, but this season coming up, because I know all eyes are going to be on Ivan Demidov, but there should be eyes on Michael Hage as well as one of the top forwards in the uh, Canadian system. Yeah. We've talked about Hage a, a lot uh, since he was drafted and in the Canadians deep dive and all that, but he's definitely worthy of being in this range uh, in the prospect lit and top 100. I think he's going to end up being a heck of a player behind Nick Suzuki. i uh, in Montreal, second line center, maybe. Um, yeah, they have a really good, I think, a one-two punch in the future uh, with him here. All right, uh, before we move to 30, I want to, the next range, I want to just mention Tom Volander being in being 33, uh, Canucks here. I, 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 I keep watching. I mean, NCAA, he'll be in the NCAA again. 
I I don't think he's he's not making any. I mean, <laughs> I don't I don't think he's making the NHL yet. And, and I know the Canucks even said they want to keep him in the NCAA to develop. But I'm I'm glad to see him in the on this list at, at this range because I think he's going to end up being a top pairing defenseman in the future. And because he's a right hand shot, he could potentially even be a guy that can play with Quinn Hughes in the future and actually be a really good partner for him because I think he's got a similar to Philip Peronic, but I think even more of an elite guy that could be in the future. So I, I'm excited to see what he can do in a second, in his sophomore season. Cause he had a really good uh, freshman season uh, too. So yeah, we'll, we'll see what he can do this year. All right, let's move to 30 to 21 as we are moving towards the top 10 here. And uh, Peter, I'll start with you. Who do you have in this range? Uh, the one that surprised us all during the 24 draft, and that's Beckett Seneca. And, you know, I, again, the talk of him probably getting a big bump in the rankings all started at the Combine, too, where it was a potential top five pick. And then, you know, as draft day got closer, we're thinking, where's he going to go? And then there was talk about top three, and it's, lo and behold, he went top three, um, which is a little bit of a surprise, I think, for all of us. But when you saw the body of work that he had, especially when you consider his playoff performance, where he just was on another level of dominance for the Oshawa Generals, he took control of every single time. And he was a key player every single time that he was on the ice before he sustained an injury. And you see that every single time with, you know, the playmaking, the ability to get behind opponents very easily, the speed, the ability to use that size to his advantage every single time. They have a lot of skilled players, but I don't think they have one that can be this t this player type or model within their system up front. And I think Seneca could be that power forward like player that's a playmaker, equal part shooter, because he's already developed a little bit of a better shot. We've seen that a little bit this season. But the way that he's able to evade pressure every single time and use that skill as advantage to crash the middle of the ice... Um, it, it's very impressive and I, they got a really good one. And if he's able to take that next step forward, it's this pick is going to pan out very well for the ducks. Yeah. Like we've said, it was, it was maybe a little surprising. He got drafted so high, but you can see his skill level and how he's going to be able to get to be a top line winger, I think in the NHL. And I think he's worth taking a chance at drafting him that high because seemed like that's where he was going to, he was going to go. Uh, another team was going to pick him around there and the ducks of course uh, grabbed him up. All right, Lucas, who do you got from this talented group? There's quite a few to choose from here. <laughs> yes, there, there are. And uh, I, I, I was, I was going, going between one. I, uh, I wanted to go with Lakara Mackey because Matthew's here. I wanted to go with Cole Eiserman because <laughs> I love goal scoring, but instead I'm going to go with Beckett Seneca's minor league teammate, Sam Dickinson, out of the London Knights in the San Jose Sharks system. Uh, watching this guy guy play at the Memorial Cup, uh, he was a 17 year old that looked like a, that looked like an overager. Like, mm -hmm. That's that's the that's that's the best compliment I could give him is that he and he and Oliver Bonk, uh, who was uh, who was earlier on the list, we didn't we didn't get a chance to talk about him. They they both looked like they were seasoned veterans uh, in the OHL, and they were and 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 Sam Dickinson's only 17. So that's the type of player that this guy is. He's tall. He's rough. He can he can chip in offensively. He's great in his own zone. He he looks like a leader, and he looks like he looks like a fifteen he looks like a fifteen year NHL player. Mm -hmm. That's that's the biggest compliment I could get him is that just watching him, he looks like he can play, uh, barring injury for oh, oh, for around fifteen years. Uh, and uh, San Jose has really really got a got a good uh, a good base. Mm -hmm. uh with this pick to help their defense they, they they figured out the offense with their with their prospect pool but this this pick uh i, I thought when they made that trade they were going to get Cole Eiser in to mm -hmm. link him up with Matt and celebrating but when they went with dickinson i think it makes more, mm -hmm. more sense now because they didn't really have that sort of stud defensive prospect and they got it now 100 that, that's one thing that they were really missing i mean nothing against ferraro but He's <laughs> he's not a. I think he's could be end, end up uh, being as Mario Ferrara could end up being. I I mean he's a good defenseman, but he's not a top pairing guy. I think Dickinson could definitely do that for sure. So he de they definitely have a base at both forward and now defense and now goaltending with Askarov. So I, I think they've got all their bases covered now. All right, uh, 
I am going to, I want to focus on a guy in here and I'm going to focus on Jonathan Lekaramaki because uh, no one else took him. Uh, he He's one of those guys. I've always loved this guy. I, I'm really happy that he was able to get over that, that injury problems that he had and the illnesses and all that stuff that he had, had to deal with in his first, uh, right after his draft year and right that draft plus one year that everyone kind of focuses on, he wasn't able to have a smooth, smooth transition to there. So I'm happy that he was able to bounce back from that. Had great playoffs in the SHL or not the SHL, the all Sven scan. Uh, and I mean, and then now he debuted in the AHL this past season, had a pretty good stint there. And now he's going to start his first full pro season uh, with the atmosphere Canucks. So I'm really excited to see what he can do. And even, could potentially get some call-ups during the year. Although with the Canucks, the way they seem to be with their prospects, they're not going to rush him. So he may get some games. I'm most likely he's going to play most of his time in the, in the AHL and light it up, hopefully light it up there. Uh, but I'm really excited to watch him in Abbotsford this season because he's right down the street from me. So I mean, I'll look going, trying to go to some games to watch him. So yeah, really excited for him to be in this range too. All right, moving into the top 20. And uh, Peter, who do you have from this group? Uh, I'm going to, I, you know, I love my power forwards and I'm going to take Ryan Leonard, um, who is ranked 18th on Logan's list. And when you look at the, his body of work so far, it's just absolutely impressive the way that he tore it up with the NTDP. And then last season as a college freshman, um, it's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, he ranked fourth in overall scoring with 60 points in 41 games, and there were only three other players ahead of him. And two of those three were, you know, Boston College teammates in Will Smith and Cutter Goche. And Macklin Celebrini was third overall in scoring. So you could tell that that those four players were the dominant or top of the top or, you know, top of the class kind of thing last season in the NCAA, but you just got to admire and love Leonard's ability to be a highly energetic and offensive producer on the wing. I mean, he never takes a shift off. He's always in motion. He's got a motor that doesn't quit with the speed, the intensity, the ability to get on the forecheck, establish it and take control every single time he's in on the attack. Um, it's absolutely impressive what he's able to do. And the fact that, the Washington Capitals had at that time, not the best prospect pool, but they made account with that eighth overall pick in 2023. And he's definitely going to be a player that they could rely on as the next wave starts to come up and old wave starts to go when, you know, Ovi's gone and everything else is like that. Um, but if he can have that, style play i don't think he's going to be an agitator but he could get it under a lot of opponent's skin because of his style of play um i don't know if he's ever going to drop the gloves or not but who knows stranger things have happened but he's definitely that player that could hold his own and he's just going to be that type of pass that you don't want to play against and it's going to work to the capitals favor that's for sure and yeah, i got tom wilson there long term so i <laughs> had him in there is that that could be a yeah. pretty good. He can learn from him, deal, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lucas. So, uh, who do you have from this uh, this group? Man, there's so many great players, and in that in that last segment, like it made me it made me think like Washington got Ryan Leonard and Andrew Crystal in the, in the same draft. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's a, that's a phenomenal job of their scouting department. And there's so many great players, but I gotta go with the highest riser in this past year. Jerome's boy. I'm going to go with Tej Genla. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the reason why I love Tej Genla and his his story is because at the beginning of the year, I don't think there was a single soul in the hockey world that wasn't really in the know that knew that Jerome Ginla had a son as good as as good as Tej. But Tej's rise throughout this year is one of the greatest rises I've seen, and maybe in the last five years because. He started off the season. People thought he was going to be, a, uh, you know, a second rounder. And then, oh, he's doing pretty well. Oh, oh, he's at the the prospects game. Oh, he's doing really well. Oh, he's doing really well. And it went from, oh, I don't know if the Flames can draft him at nine. It would be a reach to, oh, I don't think the Flames can draft him because he'll be gone. <laughs> yeah. And that's what ended up happening when Utah selected him. He's, uh, he's got a, an incredible shot. Just an incredible shot off that off that wing. Excuse me. The offensive instincts are there. The 
just he's such a great all around player and that's the type of, those are the type of guys that, that you need those are the type of guys that you covet as as prospects he's just he's everything that you need in an offensive player is what Tija Galen is going to bring you and he does it at the highest level like just just reading off the stats last season in 22 23 he had 18 points this year he gets 84 when he goes from Seattle to Kelowna and scores 12 points in seven uh U18 uh championship games mm -hmm. was one of the one of the main reasons that Canada won that gold that gold medal game against uh, the USA, and that's and the U eighteen World Champ. That's the USA's tournament to lose, and yeah. Canada took it mm -hmm. away from them uh, because of players like Tisha Ginla and Gavin McKenna, who we'll talk about in a couple of years. <laughs> uh, but that's that's why I just I love Tisha Ginla. He you need him, he's there. You need a big goal, he's there. You need a big play, he's there, and uh, and he'll and. Uh, with the with with him being the first pick in Utah, they got a great selection with him. Hundred percent, he's a guy that yeah, he definitely just kept rising as the season went on, and ends up being a guy that uh, it would have been a great story to go to Calgary, but there's no way he was dropping to there. And of course, Utah grabs him, and he's uh, now part of their new core coming up, and he's definitely going to be a headliner in Utah for a lot a long time. All right, before we move to the top 10, I want to talk about Nate Danielson because I think he's one of my favorite players. He was in the position that the Canucks could maybe. They were looking at him, but of course, Detroit drafted him before that. Um, but he he's a guy that's just going to end up being one of those do-it-all type uh, two-way two forwards that you, you can play anywhere in the lineup. I think he's going to end up starting in the third or fourth line. Um but I see a really trajectory of like a Bo Horvat type guy that can just play it, play it to start in the NHL, be a third and fourth line guy, but then start moving up and potentially be that top line, second line. Um, he's not ever going to put up 100 points, but he's going to be just that good all around center, uh, 70, 60, 70 points, but, but still a guy you need to have in your lineup to win games. And I'm really excited to see what Danielson can do with Detroit because I mean, everyone thought it was a bit of a reach where they drafted him, but the way he's developed since, I think they picked him definitely exactly where they should have. And uh, I'm excited to see what he can do uh, in the future in the NHL. And it's good he's on a team that I don't dislike. <laughs> All right, top 10. And this is where the cream of the crop is. And uh, I mean, lots of players we've talked about many times. So it could be a bit tough to pick, but uh, Peter, who do you have in this top ten that you want to talk about? Uh, I know we, I know there were a couple of other Hurricanes prospects that I probably could have picked, but I'm not going to pass up the opportunity and overlook what Alexander Nikishin has done over the last two seasons in the KHL, and you know, for being a third round pick, 69th overall in 2020, he's really looking like a money selection for the Carolina Hurricanes 55 points in 2022 23 56 last season so in two seasons he's had oh he's hit the century mark 101 points in two seasons um th this is a player that could do it all he can score he can dish the puck he's very productive at the senior level and in the last two seasons he's had the most assists and points by a defenseman in 22 23 most goals and points last season 23 24 and not only that, this is a this is the guy that you don't want to go up against. He's 6'4", 216 pounds. He can hit, he can shoot, he can pass. This is that jack of all type or jack of all trades type of defenseman that teams absolutely love and covet. And Carolina Hurricanes have it. Uh if he's able to kind of replicate this 50 point mark as a steady two-way physical offense two-way defenseman with that offensive touch, um I, I, again, this the ceiling is going to be high for him at the NHL level. It's still going to take a little bit longer for him to get there because I think he's still under contract for he has another year where it's going to be up at the end of 2024-25 at the end of this season. So just wait, Carolina Hurricanes fans and hockey fans, because what he's able to do and even like some of the like highlights that I've seen online, it's just absolutely impressive. When he gets to the NHL, there are going to be a lot of eyes on him. Yeah, really productive in the KHL last <laughs> two seasons. Uh, and 69th overall. 
So, I mean, there's another another later pick that the Hurricanes seem to have going to hit on. And, yeah, it it just they just seem to keep doing it, keep grabbing these guys. All right, Lucas, top 10. Who do you have in this group that you want to talk about? So I'm flipping between two guys, and I'm going to land on Philadelphia savior, Matt Vey, Meech Cobb. <laughs> we have been hearing about this. He's, he's almost seems like a myth. Mitch Collins yeah. almost seemed like like this myth. You just you just been hearing about him, and then and then the we myth. finally got to see yeah. him in uh in, in in the draft in 2023 after after he just blew us away at the 2021 U18 uh, World Championships when he played for Russia, and then uh and you know we, we haven't been able to see him because of definite you know external factors, mm-hmm. but you can't ignore the the skill that that this guy has. He just he. It, it, it's hard to it's not an apples to apples comparison what North American and KHL numbers are, but scoring at a point per game in the KHL, especially as a uh, as a 19 year old, 18 year old, is near impossible. Mm. And I think and, and he, he he and he he did it. He he did it or or was at, at least near it. And so if he's able to get that type of type of production in the KHL, which is a low scoring league against men. <laughs> I think the metro. I think the metropolitan division is going to be very, very, very sour in the next few years because the skill that this guy brings, the, the, the just the offensive awareness. We might be looking at a player that is the next Alexander Ovechkin. I know that's a lot to live up to, <laughs> but it, everything that we've been told about this player is that he is that guy. He is the next great Russian superstar, mm. and. And he's coming. He's coming to North America way sooner than we thought. And Flyers fans should be so happy with the fact that he wants to be here as soon as possible. And we, as hockey fans, should be so excited at the fact that we can that we can that we can watch this guy. And honestly, he's probably going to make the Philadelphia Flyers relevant for the first time in. <laughs> Help me out here, guys. Two Long years, time. <laughs> Long, Long time. Long time. <laughs> so. So that's why I'm so excited to see what Matt Van Mitchkoff can do because we've heard we've heard all about this guy for so long. We're finally going to be able to see him up close, and so there's you just can't deny the raw skill that this guy has. And obviously, you can talk about Celebrini, you can talk about some of the other guys, but I'm the most excited to see what this guy can do. Yeah, he he's already a, a big time player, and in Philadelphia, he hasn't even played a game yet. Uh, he came over to North America, I think a few weeks ago, no, wait, not just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, I think it was now. And uh, he's already been talked about top line guy. He's going to play. I mean, they're talking about potentially Tortorella and him may not get along, but we'll see if that. If, that if, torts, ru- the- if torts ruins this guy, <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be so upset. I'm going to be so <laughs> upset if John Tortorella ruins this guy. I, I feel Tortorella is gone before Michkov is. <laughs> of course, I, th- I think put, they literally the put all they put all their eggs in the Michkov basket. So of course, Torts is gone. But if he like <laughs> beats if he beats the fun out of him in his first year, I'm gonna be very I'm gonna be very not happy. Yeah, <laughs> the Goche situation 2.0. Oh, jeez. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Cutter Goche 2.0, maybe? Maybe he wants out? <laughs> <laughs> well, but again, I, ho- totally whole different circumstances with Goche. In, though, in my mind, Mishkov is coming knowing this, knowing that Tortorella, Tortorella's here. Yeah. I mean, it's not like and they, it's not like he doesn't have a reputation. They know what he is. Um, yeah, yeah. I feel he knows what situation he's going into. All right. Uh, I'm going to t- quickly talk about a guy and just quickly because everyone knows who I'm going to talk about. It's Logan Stankoven, who's going to be on off this list by the time we talk again about this top 100 because he is on the Dallas Stars. He's an NHL player. I In the playoffs, he was great. In the time that he was before that, great. Doesn't seem like he has in any league he, he plays in, he dominates. And he's already looking that. Undersized doesn't matter. He's one of those guys that you just... You, the way his size is, he's small, but he doesn't play small at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's fearless in the corners. He doesn't doesn't care what type of if he's going against a six seven guy, uh, he'll play the same way. And he's scoring in the NHL already, and has a potential to be part of that Calder Trophy conversation. He was already in that conversation, and he's been he was even able to perform in the Stanley Cup playoffs under intense pressure. I'm excited to, to watch him for a full season. And 
he's in Dallas again, another team that seemed to get those later round picks and Stan Coburn was one of them. Shouldn't have dropped to the second round. We said that many times and uh, he's proven everyone wrong every time. And yeah, I love Stan Coburn. If you can't already notice, uh, <laughs> I love him. He's great. All right. Um, that's our top 100. Um, lots of great players we did not talk about. So I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to talk about someone that we didn't talk about over this top 100. doesn't matter where they are on the list. Uh, Lucas, I, who do you want to give love that we haven't talked about? Um, just, just to mention him, uh, I, I, I mentioned him before briefly, but like Cole Eiserman, uh, on this list, we didn't get a chance to talk to him. I, 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 I can't understand how he dropped up to 20. I understand. Okay. The defensive, the defensive prob problems are there. But like he broke the NTDP record of, for goal scoring, he fills he fills the net with 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 uh, with the puck. It, when you watched him at the UA teams, he was utterly dominant. He was an absolute uh, like I, like I was afraid. I was afraid every time he he, he touched the puck. You just see Cole Hudson through the slot bang bang one timer goal like every single time. So uh, so I, 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 he's he's a player that I'm so excited to watch. Uh, and 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 it, it works out that he went to the Islanders because they've had no no goal scoring basically since Lamorello got there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I and I, I'm really excited to see this player because of because of what of what he can be. And I, I know that's all all these prospects, but the raw talent, just the raw offensive talent that's already there. Like on the defensive side, he 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 can figure that out. That's what that's what development is. That's what that's what he's going to work work at at Boston University. That's what the coaching staff at, at uh, in New York is going to is going to want out of him. But the the raw talent that he can just have, where he can just fill the net. Like I I I'm so excited to see this player. And I uh, I, I was talking with my dad, who isn't the who isn't as into pro into prospects as I am. But he he said something funny. He was like, "Well, did anyone care when Gil Fleur didn't back check?" <laughs> so so that's that's always my big thing with players like him and i i can't wait to see what he's what, what he becomes yeah cole eiserman he was in that conversation of being the first overall pick or in that con the, not the first overall pick of course South reading was going to be that but i uh, in that range where he could was going to be the next guy off the board but kept dropping and i don't understand why he dropped down to 20 yeah maybe he's a one-dimensional player right now but that can, like you said, defense can be taught. I mean, it's something that you can you can develop over time. But that pure goal scoring ability he's got, and that shot, I, I would go for every time. Every time. So I, the Islanders definitely got a good one there. All right, Peter, I'd finish it off here. Who do you want to mention that we haven't talked about here? Uh, one of the players that was trade that we talked about on the trade last week, um, in our episodes of process being dealt, and that's Rucker McGrory from the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now I was about, I was this close to saying the Winnipeg <laughs> Jets, but, uh, didn't happen. Um, obviously it was top prospect for top prospect. So they're getting their values worth where McGrory is a player that can help them out right now. And as opposed to Jaeger, they could probably help him out in maybe another year or two down the line. But you're, again, I talked about like how there's going to be a hole up the middle of the ice, but whatever. Um, the fact that McGrory is going to be in a better environment where he can make the transition to the NHL because of his physical stature, the maturity, the his two-way game, the competitive side that he has. I'm curious to see how that's going to work for him at the NHL level or even at the pro level in the AHL. But I think he's ready for the pro time right now. It's a better opportunity for him on the Pittsburgh Penguins because this is probably their last dance with, you know, the two main guys with, you know, or even three, if you want to include Latang, Malkin and Crosby, because who knows how many more runs they're going to have. So I, I, I'm curious to see that he's going to be the top prospect or the next face of the organization coming up when, when they're gone, because he's going to be. Because of his leadership skills, I could see him as captain of the Pittsburgh Penguins in the near future. Mm -hmm. I, I I do not uh, doubt that for a second. Obviously, when Crosby's gone, they're going to need a new captain. I, I do think that McGrory can't take the reins and be a leader. We've seen him be a leader at every single level. Um, obviously, production is going to be big. I think he could be a very dynamic, powerful, goal-scoring winger. Um, let's just see what's going to happen because this is a player that they they – thought highly of they got him in the trade and now it's just is this plan going to work out mm -hmm. i don't think that you're going to rely too heavily on you know a young player like that to make the playoffs but he could be a key factor going forward 
Well, there's talk that he's going to play with Crosby on the top line or give an opportunity to do that. So right he's going to have Make a good sure. guy to, to yeah. play with right off the bat. Either him or Malkin. I mean, he'll play with one of them. Um, yeah, he, I think he's he's in a good situation in Pittsburgh. It would have been a good situation in Winnipeg too, but we don't know the background stuff that mm-hmm. you didn't feel comfortable um, joining that team for whatever reason. And we'll probably never know the actual reason. Uh, but yeah, he's in a good place in in Pittsburgh for sure. All right, to finish it off the show, let's let's uh, talk about the guys that did not make the list. Uh, Lucas, is there anyone that you were expecting to see on the top one hundred that uh, didn't make it? Uh, he was in the he was in the honorable mentions, but uh, a, a player I've always liked uh, just because just because I like uh, I like fun players, I like players that have good personalities. Uh, Caden Bankier in the in the Minnesota Wild system uh, he had a pretty good year in Iowa. You know that that. Uh, that that jump from CHL to to uh, to AHL uh, it can be difficult for some players. Uh, I mean, Logan Sanko made it look easy, but uh, but it, it can be difficult for some players. He had a pretty good year adjusting, and I think he's going to get better and better and better. But uh, I, I've always I I, uh, I I love players like him that are just these little firecracker type players, you know, uh, pa- past type players. And I I really liked uh, Kane Bank here, and uh, he was a, he was a re- he was a, he was a difference maker uh, on the Canadian World Junior team that won uh, in 2023. So I have uh, I've always been I've always been a fan of him, and uh, uh, somewhat surprised that he didn't that it was just an honorable mention, not uh, and not uh, and not it, uh, on the list. But uh, but he you know he could have squeaked in on someone else's on someone else's list. Mm-hmm. But uh, that, that's a player I've always sort of had a had an eye on, and uh, and, and he didn't make the, the top one hundred. He, he was in the honorable mention, so we'll, we'll say one hundred and six. <laughs> he could have been. He could have been. He, uh, you know, he was sort of he was sort of on, on the bubble. But that, that, that's a player I've always enjoyed watching. Yeah, I, I love those types of players too. They're always uh, fun to watch for sure. All right, Peter, uh, who do you want to? talk about that did not make this list or you were surprised that didn't wasn't on here i mean he was listed as an honorable mention too and that's otto stenberg because of the mm-hmm. fact that he was drafted a little higher than theo lindstein uh from the st louis blues and because of the fact that he has that you know that very sound two-way game but he could be equal parts playmaker and shooter i thought that maybe he had that opportunity to jump into the top 100 um obviously because of the production at the Alsvenskan level uh, or even shl again young players don't get that opportunity um i do think that there is a better opportunity for him this season to probably excel and, and get a little bit more um production under his belt but um, I, I I just think that given his overall projection as that you know middle sit or you know second line third line two way type of offensive producer, I think this is something wor- worthwhile that he should probably be in the top one hundred. Yeah, it definitely. When you're looking at, uh, I mean, he was drafted higher than the guy that made the list. I mean, who knows? I mean, it, it is. I mean, good to be on the honorable mention. He was close to the top one hundred. I'll mention another guy who's an honorable mention, and he actually fell out of the top 100 because he was on their last list, and that was Atu Ratu, um, Canucks prospect, traded in that Bo Horvat trade, acquired there. I had a really, I don't know if he had a very good start to the season, but a really strong finish in Abbotsford and started showing some flashes of a guy that the Canucks are going to be really excited to have on the team at some point probably not gonna be in this season because they got so much not many spots open on the roster for him to take but i think he's he's a solid bet to be a top six center at some point um had a like i say really great second half of the season and a really good stretch there and could potentially be a top line uh center in abbotsford this year um we'll see where that all plays out but could play with little Karen Mackey. That'd be a pretty good duo. So I was a little, little surprised that he fell out of the top 100, uh, but good to be on the honorable mention there. All right. Well, top 100 uh, preseason rankings in the books here. And our next time we'll talk about the mid season. That'll be down the road. We'll see what guys are off the list. So there's going to be quite, probably be quite a few because they'll be playing their too many games, but thanks Lucas. Thanks Peter for coming on talking the top 100 next episode we'll talk about the top 10 goaltenders because that was going to be released this week the update and there is one guy that's on it that 
for some reason wasn't on it. Everyone knows who that is. Um, the last one, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll talk about the top 10 goalies and maybe the farm system rankings touch on that too. But um, man, thanks for joining us on another episode of Prospect Corner. Um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>